name is Christy Wodek, and I am the Education Outreach Director in Traverse City, and very happy to host this Coffee at 10. Um, and I'm going to let Liz do some introductions, but today's focus is preserving the traditions, preserving traditions through arts and crafts. So Liz, I'll let you introduce our panel. Hi everybody, I'm Liz Erlewine. I am the visual arts director here at Crooked Tree Art Center. Um, I am based in Petoskey and, and work in both locations. Um, and gosh, we're all working everywhere these days, right? As we were um, saying good morning to our panelists, we're realizing, oh, we think they, they're in this state, but actually they're over in this state now because we're, we're all so mobile, right? We're all over the place. So um, thanks for joining us from coast to coast. Um, we're thrilled to have you here um, in this virtual world. So this season, um, Christy and I lined up a series of um, these Zoom webinars for our Coffee at 10, um, focusing idea on ideas of preservation and conservation. So we've been um, thrilled to bring in a number of guests to talk about different ways that we could think about those themes, um, how we um, preserve art, right? Um, and how we preserve um, the land and how we preserve community. These are all some different ways that we can think about, um, about the idea of preservation and conservation and what we keep, why we keep it and why it matters. Um, as I was thinking about this, something that is really important and interesting to me is how we keep traditions and methods and processes and ideas through our artwork and our craft. Um, so we have brought together a wonderful panel for you today um, to, to join in this open conversation about these ideas. So as we're talking, um, those of you in attendance, if you have questions or comments that you wanna share, please go ahead and pipe those into the chat window. Um, you can also use the Q&A feature and Christy and I will keep an eye on those and feed those into the uh, conversation as appropriate. If you're joining us on Facebook, go ahead and fill your comments and questions right there in to the comments field and we'll be taking a look there too. So I would like to go ahead and introduce our panel. Um, everybody has done so many amazing things that I apologize I am going to read. So I want to make sure that I get acknowledgements here and then um, these guys will correct me if, if, I, if I make a mis misstep. For fir so first what I'd like to do is introduce uh, Marsha McDowell. Marsha can you just say hi and then Zoom will I'll highlight you and you can say a quick hello. Hi there. There she is. Marsha McDowell is a curator, professor, and program director at Michigan State University. Uh, McDowell's work as a publicly engaged scholar is grounded in an interdisciplinary approach to material culture and is informed primarily by art historical, folkloristic, and ethnographic theories and methodologies. She describes herself as a folklorist, educator, art historian, and curator. And I have a nice long list of all of the programs and museums that Marsha has been involved with. So we're so, um, so fortunate to have her here with us today. Excited to hear your perspective from a long career in, in thinking about these ideas and, and preserving art of the past and present. Um, thank you, Marsha. And then we also have Nancy McRae. Nancy, can you say a quick hello for us? Good morning. Nancy McRae holds a Master of Fine Arts um, from the University of Michigan with an emphasis on fiber art, but she also holds a degree from Michigan State University. We have a lot of MSU folks with us today, but some of us are still Wolverines, so we're representing both sides. Okay, so that's, that's just our, our shout out to our Big Tens. Uh, Nancy has worked as a studio artist and community arts organizer since 1994. She's an award-winning fiber artist and her current works are with tapestry, rigid heddle weaving, and compound weave structures. She enjoys branching out to other media, including printmaking and pastel painting and ways to cross train to enlarge her skill set. Thank you, Nancy, for joining us. All right, and then we have Regina Brubecker Carver. Regina, can you say hi? Bonjour. Regina is an enrolled member of the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa Indians. She comes from two separate families with a talent for making beautiful things. Her mother's people have lived in Northern Michigan for centuries and she feels the natural beauty around us inspires her people's art. Rebecca Carver loves to take a pile of materials and see their vision come to life. She plays with all kinds of fibers as well as beads. So her biggest problem is deciding what she's gonna do next. Um, thank you, Regina, for joining us today. 
And lastly, we have um, Micah Link. Um, Micah, can you say hi? Hello, everyone. Micah is joining us from um, Michigan, but she's also um, sometimes in Indiana. Uh, Micah was brought up in a world of old time tunes and dedicated pickers. Um, she's quite at home when she plays and she's a West Michigander hailing from the banks of Thorn Apple River. Micah has deep roots in Michigan's traditional music community. This background in traditional music led her to pursue a PhD in folklore from Indiana University, where she is currently a student. Her dissertation research centers on the relationship between music, material culture, identity, and belonging. Thank you, Micah, for joining us. So as you can see, we have a really rich panel here, um, lots of really interesting ideas and things to share. Um, and so to start off our conversation, I am going to um, turn to Marsha and Micah with, um, with a pretty open question, just to lay a foundation for, for what we're even talking about here. So um, we said in our title that, that we're talking about traditional arts. So what does that mean? What are traditional arts? Can one of you go ahead and let us know? Yeah. yeah. Well, Micah and I chatted beforehand and we, um, she drew the long straw. So she goes first. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she goes only. <laughs> Um, so when I think about traditional arts, um, I think about art forms that are very grounded in community. I think about art forms that have um, long histories in an individual's family or in their cultural community or their geographic community or any other sort of like identity marker. It could be religion, it could be race, it could be sexuality, gender, all of these kinds of things. So that's kind of like the first step for me in thinking about what what traditional arts mean. So like that could be the recipes that your grandmother makes. It could be, you know, the baskets that you grew up collecting things with. It could be the music that you play or the dance that you do, or even the clothing that you wear um, for special circumstances or in, in daily life. Um, so I think of, of traditional arts as first being grounded in community and secondly, having some sort of like traceable through line to the past into the present. And when I say to the past, I don't mean that the, the art form has to be unchanged. That's really important in my mind. Um, we use traditional arts and crafts as a way to, you know, grapple with our current circumstances and feel grounded in our, in our families and our communities and things like that. So I think of, of traditional arts and as a folklorist, this is um, what we talk about a lot as like, not being this bag, this unchangeable baggage that we draw draw from the past and drag along with us, but as kind of like a toolkit that meets present needs. So, um, you are you have a loss in your family. What do you do? Maybe you make the the foods that you've always grown up eating for comfort, or you're feeling disconnected. So, what do you do? You find an heirloom and you trace the genealogy of who made that thing if you can. Um, so I think of them as kind of community grounded, related to time and also kind of essential for our understanding of ourselves and for being able to be more compassionate people with each other. You know, and I, I'll just amplify a couple of things, you know, in, in bringing it to a real present time is that it was no surprise to me at all that um, the moment that the shutdown occurred a year ago, that my particular interest is in research and quilts, that the airwaves, the internet airwaves were flooded with people, you know, talking about, well, they're just turning to their fabric stash, you know, and, and not only making quilts, but making the masks because they had the fabrics, they had the tool of the sewing machine, they had the expertise um, of sewing um, and knowing how to construct. And, you know, they wanted to have, uh, to protect their family, but they also wanted to contribute to the community. And so their skill directly supported community health, family health. And um, yeah, so, you know, it was just, of course they would have done that. And, and I think, um, 
you know, the same way with knitters, you know, the people that were just, uh, you know, taking up knitting or, or beading or other crafts or making music, were doing it to maintain a sense of well-being for themselves and also to share a sense of healing with other people. So I have a question. Um, both of you um, do research in areas of traditional arts as well as folklore. So can you talk for a minute about the connection between those things and, and how they overlap and how they differ? Mm. You, well, let me just say a little anecdote about why I got started in this because I trained as a fine artist. Uh, I, I trained as a, um, I have a master's degree in etching, you know, printmaking. And um, when I was a grad student, I was asked in my class or my course of study to do a presentation or extend paper on some aspect of visual art. And I thought, oh my God, I've got these amazing quilts that were made by my great grandmother. They were, they were spectacular. And I felt I didn't really know as much as I should about them. So I went in and proposed that paper as my topic. And the professor told me that was really one of the stupidest ideas he'd ever heard. And that made me think, I am going to prove that, no, this is important stuff. It just hasn't been written about. It just hasn't been showcased and held up as important, but it is every bit as important as the paintings that are on the wall in this gallery. And so um, I, I, I think that in my own pursuit of this is that, and why I describe myself as book, both a folklorist, I am a folklorist and an art historian. I study the visual, but I think in order to understand the visual, you have to hear the stories and you have to know the stories. So that's where the folklore intersects with the um, exploration of the visual world. Yeah, I think in folklore studies, we often talk about um, communication as kind of being the essential component. We talk about folklore studies as a kind of a combination of anthropology and like literature in, in that it's about what's being communicated through the stories we tell, but it's not just, you know, the grand myths or like the supernatural legend that we have about the dog man in the Upper Peninsula or whatever. Um, but it's also that we're communicating through the things we create and we're communicating for through our food and we're communicating through our dress and things like that. So to my mind, that that's where those things are completely intrinsically linked. And that's why you see so many people who would self-identify as folklorists or, or who are coming out of um, folk arts programs or people who are traditional artists who would call themselves folklorists. It doesn't re necessarily require academic training, um, but, but those things are so intrinsically linked because it's all about how we communicate ourselves to the world and how we communicate with each other. And we do that through our creative practices and often those are what we would call traditional arts. I think it's really hard to draw lines between what is and isn't traditional because if you if you're looking at it through this lens of like culture and community most things can be um, framed in a way that's about what we're sharing with each other and and um, what we're trying to communicate and understand. Thanks. Well, I'm going to come back and, and find out a little bit more of both of you and your creative background, but I'm going to turn it um, over to our practicing visual artists right now um, to, to hear a little bit about that and um, how, uh, so, so this is to, to, I'll go to you, Regina, first, um, thinking about tradition um, and how it relates to your creative practice. Um, do, do you think that it matters? Um, and if so, how? You wanna tell us a little bit about what you do? And, and again, if you want me to share those images, I can't, so. Okay. Um, first off, Buju, Ejin Carver and Dijnikaz, Waganaka Sing Odawak and Dao, Makwa and Dodam, Kanwing and Donjaba. That is how I introduce myself in our local language. And I do that um, not just to profess myself Native American. As you can tell, I'm not full-blooded. 
but so that my ancestors, those spirit beings around us will recognize me because I use their language. Uh, we are deeply connected to the past, our traditions. Um, to go to, to add to what they were saying about storytelling, stories are so important because before the Europeans came here, we did not have a written language. We passed everything on um, through storytelling. No one took notes. You know, you, you learned by watching the people who came ahead of you. When you were little, you know, the, the grandparents would teach you how to make knives, how to make baskets, how to cure a hide, all of these skills that were learned and they were to preserve life. We didn't have a Walmart we could run to to buy anything. So the past is so important because if you don't know where you came from, how do you know where you're going to go? You know, um, while it's okay to wander, it's good to, to understand that, to have a goal. Uh, in my, my bio, I said that I love to take a pile of materials and have them tell me what they're supposed to be. I can find a beautiful color of beads that inspire me, but if I don't see a vision, I can't start making something, or if I try, it'll be a fight all the way. And nine times out of 10, I'll end up taking it apart and just abandoning that idea. I cannot force things to go where they don't want to go. And anybody who's ever tried to sew a quilt or knit a sweater or something gets that fight. You know, will and determination will only get you so far. You have to have that vision. And that vision comes from our roots. Um, is that a, is that? <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Sorry, I have a little lag, so I didn't know if you were continuing. I would love to take this as a chance to um, to hear a little bit more about what you do in your own creative practice. Um, do you want me to go? I'm going to screen share those images you sent me, and you can you can tell our audience a little bit about it. Is that okay? Okay, go right ahead. Uh, last year there was a Facebook challenge that went out to take ten days of sharing your the things that you create your own creations. And so I was going around finding pictures or taking pictures of things that I had made. And these are three of those. So nice. I am a social artist in many ways where the things that I'm drawn to over and over again are um, knitting and beading, doing beadwork. But if you sit me down with a group of basket makers, I will pick up materials and make a basket. I am inspired by the flow from other people. If you sit, if, if I get to sit with one of my, um, my main inspirations, who is Yvonne Walker Kishik, who is the local quill artist, who is renowned across the country, um, I will do quill work. I will, I will play with anything in a group setting, but I have certain things that I'm drawn to. So this beadwork piece here is a choker that was uh, inspired by a drawing I saw of a ribbon work pattern. Um, and so I thought, well, how would that turn out in beads? And so I was just playing with it and it, it kind of made itself. I turned it into a, a necklace, a medallion, but I was never really satisfied with it. So then I tried turning it into a choker and I love it. So that's where it is now. Um, one of the other photos that Liz has, I believe is one of the three quill boxes I've made in my life. I don't know if you can show that one. Yeah, I don't know why this is misbehaving. Hold on. Okay. All right. Uh, so Yvonne, Ke Yvonne Kishik will do workshops, or she used to before um, the pandemic hit, and she would teach you how to make a quill box. And then after that, you were always welcome to sit down at her table and, and quill with her. So I made these two. There's a three and a four inch basket. And with most Native American arts, you'll find that they're all um, based in practicality. So quill boxes used to be used to contain um, food items or basically they were storage boxes. And the quill design started because they would um, do a design on there so you would know what was in there without taking the lid off. So you could just look over your boxes and know automatically which one you wanted. So now they're mostly decorative. Um, um, Regina, can you tell our uh, viewers a little bit about the process of making this and when you say quill boxes, what really they are? Because I think maybe we're assuming people know, know things they don't know. 
You're, you're right, I am. Okay, so a quill box is made out of um, porcupine quills. And yes, we do go out and collect those from porcupines. And I have, I have to admit, there was one time I passed a fresh kill on the road and I stopped and picked it up and I still have those quills uh, waiting to be made into a project. And birch bark and sweetgrass and sinew. Yeah, those are the four things. So it's quite a process. You take the, the top, the blank, and do your main design. But then I don't, uh, you can kind of see it down at the bottom where it goes around the edges. And even oh. the bottom of the box has quills on it. And then it's got a lining on the inside so that the quills don't show on the bottom. When you take the lid off, it's just, it's birch bark. And then it's edged with the sweet grass. So when you pull that box off, that lid off, you get that smell of the sweet grass from it. Um, and those were to keep insects and little critters out. So the, and there's a whole tradition or culture that goes with collecting those materials. For instance, porcupines can only be, those can only be harvested a certain time of year because they're thicker in the winter. And the sweet grass or the, well, the sweet grass, you have to get when it reaches a certain length before the sun starts to burn it in summer. So you, you wanna get it in late spring, early summer. And unfortunately the sweet grass is, it used to be all across the state because it grows near water. And so many of our sweet grass beds are gone now because there are luxury homes and resorts and hotels all along our, our lakes and river beds. So we're fortunate to have one one patch that most people know of that we go and, and pick from and we have a friendly relationship with that owner so we're allowed to go in and do that um and birch bark also needs to be harvested at a certain time of year when the sap is running because then the bark peels away from the tree and it doesn't kill the tree if you if you take it when it's not ready you will the tree will die so a lot of that can't be taught, it has to be experienced. You have to go with someone who knows what they're doing and learn when the proper time for all of this is. Um, there is so much that I wanna jump in and talk about that, but I'm gonna show your, your last example and, the, and then revisit um, some of those ideas. Um, so here's the last image that you shared with us. Okay, so this is, uh, a vintage Pendleton vest that I picked up at one of the resale stores. I admit to being a resale junkie and I get a lot of inspiration from there. Also a lot of materials that I work with. So the design on there is what's called um, satin applique and they're, they're based on um, beadwork designs. So if, if I'm sure if you've looked at a museum, you see native beadwork there and they're all based on floral designs. And what I was told is that when the European settlers came with their embroidered clothing, the Jacobian embroidery, uh, we saw those designs and, and wanted to turn them into objects that we could use. And so that's where the, the satin applique started. And let's see, there are certain colors that are more traditional than others, and it's based on what materials were available to us. So a lot of times, if you go to the powwow now, you'll see all of these bold, bright colors and sparkle and things. Those are traditional, but they're not cultural because we use what's available to us in the moment. You know, I'm sure if our ancestors had had access to all of that bling, they would have used it. Oh, I love that distinction that it's um, tr the distinction between tradition and cultural and that, that, yeah, okay, they wouldn't have had those items, but it's very true to, to our tradition to take what was available. That's a beautiful idea. Ancestors were extremely practical. They used what they had. And that's an interesting idea than thinking about the objects that you shared with us. So um, thinking about that idea, about it being practical and, be, and being functional. And then let's think about those quill boxes, right? Um, they still function, they're beautiful, but the, the creation of them in, in a maybe modern day and age here might feel impractical in the sense that you could go and pick up a box to hold whatever you wanna hold, right? Um, but looking at those objects and hearing the process of making, it's not hard for me to imagine why 
why it is important and why it is practical to still make them. Can you, can you talk about your thoughts on that a little bit? Um, to think of art as food, you know, that are the things that we use as food for our soul, our spirit. Um, yes, I can take a, a plastic box that I bought at Walmart and it will hold my, my corn seeds just as well as this quill box will. But there's no pleasure in handling that plastic box. I don't know anything about the manufacturer of that. I don't know anything about the hands that made that. I can't take that plastic box and hand it on to my, to my descendants and know that they're going to value that and take care of that. But I can create that quill box and I can share the story of where that came from and how I learned and I can pass that on to people. After, after I am done enjoying the use of it, I can pass it on to someone else and know that that box is going to function and that that story is going to get passed on with it. Well, grandma made this or Aunt Gina made this or you know, whoever ends up with it, that they will pass that on also. It's beautiful. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry. With my leg, this is a little awkward. Thanks for bearing with me, you guys. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to turn this over to Nancy um, now. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about your contemporary creative practice and relations that you see between um, what you do and what might be considered tradition. Well, I have been sort of struggling with that question since we first chatted. Um, I, I am a fiber artist through and through. I've dabbled in many other different art forms and I keep being drawn back to fiber and specifically weaving. I'm not sure why I'm compelled to do that, but it is, it, it is what I'm compelled to, um, to do. And oh, I apologize for my dog. There's someone on my street. Oh, Desi, no, 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 sweetie. Um, I, I draw um, from long-standing technical tradition. I know how to warp and weave on a loom because of thousands of years of people doing so and developing that technology. There's technology that exists that can do finer images than, than even I can do, but it's machine done. There's no sense of the hand in it. So I haven't, I haven't explored jacquard weaving or um, really computer controlled weaving much because that does take my hand away from it. And I'm not, I'm not personally as interested in that. And my uh, tapestry weaving, again, those techniques are from um, eons ago and I apply them in a different way. My lens is more of a, um, fine art lens because that's my educational background, but my, and my inspiration varies depending on what's going on in my life and everyone else's life. Um, it, it, my work has in the past been political or about the environment. Uh, since moving to this region, my work is always about living here. I'm going to attempt a screen share, wish me luck. I hope it works. Um, that's not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. it? Okay. Oh, I see. I feel like with every Zoom update, there's just a subtle shift <laughs> with each button I have to press. <laughs> oh, I don't know what to, oh, there. Do you see that? No, you're not. At the, at the top, does it say share the screen at the very top of your screen? No. No? Oh, there you go. Like, there we yeah. are. It was at the very bottom. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is a tapestry I made a few years ago. It is simply a road that I walk down past this field mm -hmm. on a daily basis. So there's um, no deep concept except that I developed a relationship with this particular field simply by walking past it, and I felt compelled to document that. 
this is a more recent piece. Let me get rid of this other one. Oh, this piece um, here is called Blood Breath. And it was, um, I initiated a show concept with a friend of mine called Elemental, where we invited regional artists to make art about their relationship with the region. And so this one um, evolved from a sort of a, a body figure with um, the river system embedded into the lung area. And that was a companion piece to this one. This is me standing next to it. Uh, which is um, a, a double weave pickup depiction of um, the river system in the Great Lakes area. Nancy, what scale do you work in? You can see the one photograph with you standing um, next to your work, but do they vary in size? Oh, they do. They vary in size. I, I tend to like to work as large as I can, which is not large enough. The uh, blood breath piece is... Um, uh, 30 inches by about 50 inches. Thank you. Um, so, so what Nancy alluded to, this was kind of fun when I reached out to Nancy about joining us for this conversation, she said, oh, well, I suppose I could join as somebody who, who doesn't really see, right, the sea tradition as, as a key piece of what you're doing or, or something along those lines. Um, well, I you know I think what I said was that I've been trying to subvert that in my work. Mm. <laughs> and um, what I really am looking to subvert is the, um, our, our, our larger culture doesn't tend to value work that is made by women traditionally that have a practical purpose traditionally and fiber art is placed squarely in that category and I want my work to be seen as fine art without the baggage. But I was listening to a friend of mine on a podcast um, the, the, I went to grad school with her and now she is off in Canada teaching and she talked about um, the strong association of fiber artwork with dish towels. Dish towels, dish, dish towels, sorry, are wonderful, but that's not what I'm striving for. And she talked about that as well. And she talked about it as being really a powerful um, metaphor and that you can mine that for concept. Mm. So I'm trying to learn to embrace those challenges rather than subvert them or ignore them, but that's kind of where I am at right now. That's very fascinating. Um, you know, it's something that I think about too. I remember um, a time in undergrad when I was talking with a graduate student who, who was a woman and she used um, fibers in her art and she was doing this thing with doilies and we were talking about gender and art and, you know, in my naive early whatever, I was thinking, well, gosh, I want to make art that you don't know what my gender is, you know, that, that you can't identify it. And, and at the time, I, I wouldn't have been able to look at it this way, but now I see that it was because of all that baggage, right? Because it was, it was the fear of being associated with those ideas in a negative way. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Micah. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your current research, because I'm thinking some of these topics relate to what's been floating around in your head and, and what you've been working on. Yeah, so my dissertation research that I'm, you know, I just progressed, finished my classes, took my PhD exam, and now I'm in the dissertation phase, um, phase three of three, I guess we could say. Um, and the dissertation that I'm working on is about um, women's and, you know, femme people's dress in the old time music community, because um, I will find any way I can to smash music and material culture studies together. Um, <laughs> So what I'm, I'm interested in the way that people use kind of their daily dress to um, communicate things about their identities, communicate things about like, you can tell by the way I'm dressed that I belong here kind of thing. Um, 
and specifically I, I'm an old time musician, so that's a community I'm already familiar with and and there are certain kind of ways that people will not not everyone, nothing can be a blanket statement, but you know, there is this sort of like what folkness of like a uh, you know, kind of prairie style dress and lace up leather boots and having long hair. Um and so I think a lot about the ways that people either over express feminine um identity or the way that people do the complete opposite like Nancy's saying and say no I'm gonna wear a cut off jeans and a like tank top and like a trucker cap and that's the complete <laughs> opposite side of the spectrum and and that's communicating something also about what I am and who I'm subverting and who I'm pushing back against um because there there is baggage around the the expected and around tradition and around claiming the, the title of being traditional um, and like kind of put people policing those concepts and you, you, you can get stuck in these sort of webs of like, are you traditional enough or are you folk enough um, to be accepted? And like specifically in the old time music community, you know, there's, there's a lot of things about like, oh, do you play the oldest version of that tune or like do you know which person that that ballad came from um so i'm i'm thinking about the ways that the the dress style that you choose to to wear specifically at like festivals and gatherings um can help um you be believed as someone who belongs in that space so that's kind of the broad the broad dissertation topic there i've started doing some brief interviews with um, and then the, the final piece of that is connecting historical photography of old time music performers with contemporary photography, portrait photography um, of both to see how the way people are kind of aligning themselves with the tradition in the past through their visual representation in the present. So um, I'm wearing this dress and I'm getting a tintype portrait taken of me. Does that look like this portrait that was taken in 1925? Um, and so that's kind of my elevator pitch for my dissertation research. <laughs> um, there are a couple of uh, technical things I'm going to get back to you um, with Nancy, but I, I want to um, I want to explore these ideas just a little bit more because um, I think what's coming up is that is that relationship with with identity and tradition, and I, I think that's that's key for, for everybody that we've heard um, from so far. So um, I, I don't know who to turn it over to, so let's see who wants to speak up, but um, I guess I'm just looking for someone to comment on, on your thoughts on that. Like how important is it to, to subvert or embrace tradition as you find your own personal identity? Anybody want to? Yay, Nancy, go for it. Well, I, what, what I was hearing come through um, with Micah was the search for authenticity. And I, I think that that is true of um, anyone who makes things. They, they are looking for authenticity in how they are communicating whatever their idea is. I um, listened to Regina and I was really intrigued and maybe a little jealous of how internalized her relationship with her past is and how aware of that she is. And I, I don't feel that awareness of my connection with my past in that same way. So I don't feel that I'm as informed of, in that way. And while I'm searching for my authentic, authenticity, I don't have um, the models to uh, honor in that way. I have to look for authenticity in my own guttural experience. Um, yeah, well, so Regina, do you want to comment on that? Because to me, I'm assuming this is not, this wasn't this there, this is a battle. This is something you work for, right? Or, or am I looking at it wrong? It is. Um, while Micah was talking, I was thinking that I, I worked I recognize and I share her experience where people are asking you, well, are you enough? That's what I always get from this because on, the, on my mother's side, I'm Native American and we have been here in the Great Lakes for 500 years and in this continent for thousands of years. And on my father's side, we're descended from uh, 
Swiss Mennonite ancestors who came here in the 1700s. So when I say I'm deeply rooted in this country, I am. But because I have those two sides, I get people who look at me as not white enough or not red enough. And I'm, I'm never going to be enough as I am for everybody. So I just have to settle on being enough for me. And I have to acknowledge both sides of me. I'm proud to belong to both of them. I feel very privileged to have these, these two root ways that are so different, but complementary. Um, and, and I know that not everybody has that advantage. So I kind of got lost down the rabbit hole there. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> Oh. Well, I, I mean, I think you spoke to it. I guess I was just, um, I was thinking about um, how much of culture um, specifically for uh, Native American Indians has been, uh, you know, limited and suppressed or, or, or something that you've had to seek out. Did you feel that way in your own practice in connection with that part of your roots? Okay, I am surrounded by people who manage to keep these these skills alive. And so I, I would like to give a quick sh shout out to several of them. I learned beadwork from my mother, Rita Gasco Shepherd. She remembered as a child in Indian town, Harbor Springs being taught to bead by her grandmother. And so after she passed away, we started doing beadwork as a way of uh, keeping her close in our hearts. Um, I learned most of what I know about sewing from my aunt Leona Martin, who was, uh, who was on the Mennonite side but who did quilting for a living. And she would, she would create these beautiful quilts. Um, basket making, I learned that and much about uh, a native perspective about art from uh, Renee Dillard, who is a master basket maker in our community. Um, I learned about how to look at something and take it apart and figure out how it was made by working with Frank Edwagishik, who was a potter, who taught himself to make traditional native pots from studying ones that survived and reading historical accounts in anthropology collections and rediscovered this technique for how to make them and is very, very generous in sharing how to, how, how to make things. And his process for how, how he learned was really informative. So there's a, there's a generosity in the community with passing this information on. And I think it's connected to our storytelling past. But from an outside perspective, yeah, there's been times when we've had to fight for our right to, to celebrate our culture, um, powwows, um, ceremonies, all of these things were forbidden the Native American community until I think it was 1972 when they passed a law allowing us to practice our own religions again. We, we could, you could go to jail if you were caught having a sweat lodge ceremony. Um, so a lot of things went underground and a lot of really important historical artifacts were lost because the priests would come in and tell people that you need to burn all of those um, those tools of Satan, or you're going to have to leave. You know, th there was always that threat of being removed out to Oklahoma or someplace someplace else. So, a lot of things went underground, and, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of things aren't shared with the greater community, where that why they're kept internally. You know, there's there's this outward show that we do. But then there's also a quieter life on the inside that that you really have to know people before they open up and share that with you. Yeah, that's an interesting idea of protecting it in that way. You know, I think that's that's really interesting. Well, we, we learned over 300 years that you you keep it quiet. Wow. We're having some um, questions coming in from the chat and, and I'm not sure I'm catching it all. So, so I'm 
going to switch directions just slightly, but absolutely, if anybody wants to comment on some of those rich topics or, or add something into our Q&A and chat, please do so. Um, but one question that I did catch coming in through the conversation, which is something that, that I sort of struggled with in thinking about coming up with the title for what we're going to talk about today and my own experience um, in, in interest in contemporary art is... Um, Tangentially, we're, we're still dealing with issues here that kind of talk about hierarchy in art itself, right? The idea of art versus craft. And we have a lot of folks here um, amongst us now who are trained kind of formally as fine artists, people who are carrying crafts along. And, and we, do, we do have that baggage of like, oh, is one more important than the other? Or do we have to be recognized, you know, it, in certain spheres. So um, do any of our panelists want to talk about that and, and how you see that relate to, to your own research and creative practice? Yeah, go ahead, Marsha. Um, well, as I had mentioned earlier, you know, my, the impetus for me looking at traditional arts was that, that encounter in graduate school. But I, I've been studying quilts now, seriously, for 40 years. I've made one and I can sew, but I'm really passionate about the research part of it. And um, one of the, the big projects I'm working on, and I might as well sh share a screen right now. I can show two, two different things. Um, let me just go to first, let's see. Yeah. And here it comes. So, um, you know, I'm the director of the Michigan Traditional Arts Program. Micah uh, coordinates some of the programs within that, the statewide program. And, and one of the things that we did early on in the formation of this now almost 40 year program is, um, is to start documenting and preserving records and information and the stories about certain features of traditional arts in Michigan. And one of the things that we did is uh, started documenting quilts. And that data was derived from community members who contributed information on what they made, stories about what they did, and images. And then, okay, we were send, they were sending them to us. And then we were going like, oh, but well, we've got to make this material accessible. Other states were doing similar projects. So I now had this uh, in the director of what's called the Quilt Index. You can all go online. It's free to go online. The URL is up at the top there, all one word, quiltindex.org. And you can see tens of thousands of quilts, but you can also see the quilts that were made in Michigan. I'm just in real time going to do this. So you can hear, see a little bit about the Michigan Quilt Project. We've documented quilts that are in collections and then you can see all of the quilts that are from each place, like, you know, and, and get to see more about them. And then you can do some neat things of compare and contrast by clicking on a quilt and clicking on another one. But the point I wanted to make, not only is this an, a documentation project going on, we are not making any differentiation about what is traditional or what is fine art. If somebody says it's a quilt and it was made in Michigan or it has meaning to somebody in Michigan, you say, fine, It'll, it's gonna go up in there. So you can look at this resource and see the gamut of motivations for making quilts, types of quilts, quilts that are, not, are, are made for traditionally for beds, some are made for walls. And some of them are, you know, traditionally in a rectangular shape, and some of them are round. Some of them are made of, you know, uh, cotton. Some of them are made of rubber. You know, it's it just it, it, it's it's the gamut of this art form that we're looking at, this creative expression. So I just thought that that might help answer that question a little bit, and simultaneously, I had this already. To screen share anyway. Yeah, perfect. It's great to see. And, and I think it does, right? Um, I think that it's pretty clear that there isn't really a one size fits all. Um, and, and that, you know, those of us who are drawn, drawn to make maybe some of these distinctions 
aren't that important. They exist, right? Because we know it it comes with this baggage, but but maybe it maybe it right. doesn't doesn't really matter. And while I while I'm still, you know, got my screen um, shared, I'm just gonna quickly show something I've been working on in, you know, uh, Regina, I'd be keen to um, you know, hear your comments on this. It's a project I'm working on with Minnie Wabanimki. And these are mm -hmm. quilts that were made uh, by Odawa women mm. um, in or around Peshabi town. Likely some of the quilting activity was done in the basement of the church. But um, because of our documentation project, we started, we, we, one of the first quilt discovery days we did was uh, uh, somebody in Traverse City brought this one to our attention. And then another one uh, in Petoskey, another Quilt Discovery Day, they brought that one in and we're going, wow, those are really different, but they really look like woodland Indian floral designs there. And then lo and behold, over these years, we've now identified seven of them. Frank Edward Gieschick owns one that was owned by his grandfather. And um, yeah, Minnie Wabanimki's cousin owns one that was made by Minnie's in, in her cousin Sue's grandmother. But anyway, it's, you know, are these art? You know, are these finer? Uh, you know, it, are they traditional? Certainly there's, you know, there's elements of traditional floral designs, but was a star quilt design traditional within that particular Odawa community? Was it introduced by missionary? I, who knows? We're, we're, we're scratching trying to find out these these questions. All I know is they're beautiful. They I are beautiful. beautiful. They are beautiful. Um, I actually found a book at one of the secondhand store crawls that I was doing on the quilt project done by oh. the by the Michigan State University. And I saw those two quilts in there um, by that artist. Um, they were the black background with the star quilt design with the woodland embroidery and I recognized it right away and it's almost like a punch to the heart when I see native art that once in a great while I get confused but most of the time it's like my soul recognizes that I almost cry mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm aware that there's this debate between craft versus art mm -hmm. but I don't I don't live there I, I make things because they're, because I'm driven to, same as um, the tapestry weaver. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Let me, let me gather here. Um, okay. So it kind of goes back to that question of being enough. You know, am I white enough? Am I red enough? Am I artistic enough? Am I creative enough? Am I crafty enough? I don't care. I make things because they want to be made. I don't recreate things. I don't mass produce things. I will never repeat a design. So I'm sorry if you like this, but you want it in orange instead. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen because that doesn't feed my soul. So whatever that makes me, it makes me and that's enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. So anyway, the, that was what I was going to share. If we have time, I still have a uh, two more quick documentation projects and yeah. I won't say much about them. I'll just show. Yeah, we have about five minutes. So um, Marsha, if you want to share those and then I do yes. have some technical questions for Nancy. So those in attendance, if you have any um, final questions, please feed them in there so we can see if we can catch them before we wrap up today. Yeah, so another uh, repository of documentation is the Michigan Barn and Farmstead survey and it's done in collaboration with the Michigan Barn Preservation Network and it means that there are people out there who know timber framing today and another one of those skills that is not as common and then the Michigan Glass Census and Liz thank you for repositioning your computer so you could have the uh, windows behind you but we have a, rep, um, a documentation on architectural stained glass in Michigan and you can search this for buildings in your community. You can search the artists, or the studios who made the stained glass, often in churches, but not always. And um, yeah, in all of these projects, you can 
contribute with your own information and documentation too. So that's all I'll say. That's great, thank you. Okay guys, we have just a few minutes left. And so now it's just gonna be a little, not, not too continuous. I'm just gonna hit on some of the things that people are asking about and, and any other last um, comments that, that anyone on our panel wants to make. So Nancy, we did have a couple people asking about your technical process for weaving and whether you had photos of your looms, how big you work, anything like that, that you're, you're equipped to share with us right now. Um, well, probably the easiest way to see works in progress on looms would be to go to my Instagram account N M C R A Y. Um, I'll just put that. I'll put that. And I uh, frequently post works in progress, and you're going to see them on the loom. I just shared your Instagram account. Oh, thank it, you. That, that's okay. I'm trying to share them and not interrupt. Oh. So keep going. Uh, so um, I currently have a piece on my floor loom. It is uh, 36 inches wide and it's going to be nine feet tall. And it is a double weave pickup of um, birch trees that are on my street. Um, I, uh, I, I think that similar to Regina, I get my inspiration by someone, you know, something <laughs> telling me that I need to weave that. I was looking for my next project and I was looking hard and I was trying to force it. And I kept seeing these birch trees saying, I'm over here, weave me. And finally I gave into that and I am so happy with the process on this piece, but it's something that was gifted to me, not something that I was able to go out and secure as an idea. I'm not sure if that's making sense to most of you, but um, I'm, I'm really, I'm sort of rediscovering that way of working rather than trying to chase down a concept, allowing myself to accept what I'm supposed to do next. I think that's a very inspirational end for um, for those of us who do enjoy creating and making in, in all the various realms in which we can do that. So, so thank you very much, Nancy. Um, are there any final comments that any of you would like to share with us um, before we wrap it up for today? Thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much for coming, you guys. Um, obviously, we could... Um, go on and on and, and dig deeper and deeper. So I hope that um, those of you in uh, Northern Michigan seek out some of the work of our fantastic artist, Regina and Nancy, and look forward to hearing more about your research, Micah, and catching you at festivals once people can, can gather once again. Um, and I do wanna um, let you know that, that I'm excited that Regina will be part of um, an exhibition here at Crooked Tree Art Center coming up in the fall. So um, on September 20th, I believe, we, we are going to open an exhibit that is co-curated with Eric Hemingway um, at the Tribe and Regina and her sisters um, have beautiful work um, that, that we will be showcasing and, and you'll have an opportunity to engage um, with some of these stories and ideas um, again with us. So, so thank you, Regina. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Micah. Thank you, Marsha. And of course, thank you, Christy. Um, if you guys have any follow-up questions, please reach out to Christy and I. Um, and I want to just thank you all for joining us today. We'll share the link to this conversation. So if you know somebody who couldn't join us today, um, they can re-watch it later. And I'm just going to say one thing to everybody who attended as a panelist and as an attendee, you are enough. So thank you very much for everything that everyone is doing. Miigwech. Miigwech. Bye. -bye.